During the run-up to the 2008 US presidential election, a team of seven neuroscientists published a piece in the New York Times in which they scanned the brains of 20 swing voters. In the fMRI scanner, the participants were shown photos and videos of candidates. The neuroscientists noted and reported some of the results. Certain words and photos led to high levels of activity in the amygdala, the part of the brain associated with anxiety. Similarly, the insula is associated with disgust, which was also triggered. Although at first Mitt Romney's photo led to activity in the amygdala, anxiety related, the videos of his speeches subsequently sparked the greatest amount of brain activity, and so he showed the most potential as a candidate. Two of the candidates had work to do, because photos and videos of them indicated, and I quote, a notable lack of any powerful reactions, positive or negative. Those two candidates, John McCain and Barack Obama, who both eventually beat all of the others mentioned in the primaries and, well, you know. The authors wrote, our findings suggest that Mr. Obama has yet to create an impression on some swing voters. But three days later, the Times published a letter from 17 other neuroscientists who were critical of the piece, its flawed reasoning, and the fact that it hadn't undergone peer review. Other studies are equally as questionable. One study claimed to have found the neural correlates of hate by comparing reactions to politicians with photos of ex-lovers or work rivals. And so the media are quick to claim that the future, the neuro future, is here. Neuromarketing, neuroeconomics, neurophilosophy, neurohistory, neurotheology, neuropolitics. On closer inspection though, a lot of these studies don't seem to be as black and white as they first appear on the surface. Take this series of popular and oft quoted studies that claims to be able to tell the neurological difference between liberals, progressives and conservatives. It's been shown that liberals or progressives have a larger or more active anterior cingulate cortex. That's the ACC to you and me. It's the area that's used for detecting and resolving conflicts and errors. It's also the area that's said to be responsible for keeping emotions under control. Whereas conservatives are more likely to have a larger amygdala, that pesky emotional area that is responsible for fear and anxiety. As one article by behavioural therapist Andrea Kozuski in Discover magazine puts it, too much emotion gets in the way of logical thinking. Now, remember that quote. It's from one of America's top popular science magazines. So much of the rhetoric around the brain scans of liberals and conservatives goes something like this. And from it, people infer that, for example, progressives and liberals are more suited to change because they are more rational, using more of the anterior cingular cortex. And conservatives are more fearful of change, and so more emotional. In that Discover Magazine article, Kozuski writes, Conservatives were found to have a larger right amygdala, the side activated when attempting to hide or suppress an emotional reaction, rather than using logic and reason to reassess a situation. Also take a look at this clip from The Big Think, a media organisation that has 2.2 million subscribers on YouTube. Conservatives tended on the whole to have a larger right amygdala, amygdala being a deeper brain structure that processes more inf um, emotional information, specifically fear-based information. So the, it's really responsible for the flight or fright response. So if your amygdala is screaming at you, you know, run for the hills or, you know, double down and fight, it's hard to say, well, let me take a step back um, and not have a fear-based reaction, but instead present the science or present the new information. The picture being drawn is that neuroscience is objective and unbiased, 
and the results are in, Conservatives are simply scared, they're fearful. But is it really that simple? Actually, no. As philosopher Jan Slaby puts it, this is fMRI trash. Neuroscientists Sally Sattel and Scotto Lilienfeld warn of the limitations of neuroscience in their book Brainwashed. And luckily, most neuroscientists are aware of the dangers of overemphasizing results. Neuromania, neurohubris, and neurobollocks are some of the terms that have been used to describe the fashion. So, neurobollocks, what's really going on? The brain is the most complex structure known to man. It has 80 billion brain cells, or neurons, and each of those are networked with thousands of others. When we scan the brain with fMRI, that's functional magnetic resonance imaging, we can only see where extra blood is pumped. So if we scan the brain of someone scared of spiders next to a spider, and then scan the brain of a conservative, and the same area lights up, they both must be fearful, right? Well, it's not as simple as that. There are thousands of interpretations and variations here. First, the brain is not the same as the mind. The mind, our thoughts and the way they're thought, are a product of the brain, the fleshy lump of meat in our skulls. Or look at it like this. You could analyse the physicality of words and letters with a ruler, a colour detector to see what colour they are, a protractor to look at the angles of the letters, research the chemical composition of the ink. You could do all these things intricately over and over again ad infinitum. But none of these scientific methods would ever lead you to find out what the words mean and how their meanings are developed. And of course, the brain contains the mind and the mind contains words. Consciousness then is something more than the biochemistry of the brain. Sattel and Lilienfeld call the assumption that neuroscience alone can answer all the big questions about psychology, sociology and politics, neurocentrism. We still have to interpret the results of the scan with the body of knowledge we've acquired from other disciplines. Philosophy, for example. So, let's take philosophy. With it, we can see that there are other ways of thinking about the results of the neuropolitical studies mentioned in the first part of this video. For example, liberals and progressives like progress. They're good then at being adaptable to a changing environment, to new things. That's fine, we kind of knew that already. Conservatives, on the other hand, prefer conserving. They like stability and tradition. And we knew that already. It's inherent in the definition of the word. And we know that both liberals and conservatives are motivated to make the country better, to protect the group. One way to do this is to nurture the group, provide for the group so it grows. Another way is to protect the group from any threat. As psychologist Ronnie Yanoff Bullman argues, and this is without the use of fMRI incidentally, liberals are focused on providing, on welfare, while conservatives are focused on protecting. Protecting the group might involve being more suspicious of something new before accepting it. And both ways of thinking are necessary and are a product of how we all think psychologically in our personal lives. We protect ourselves from heights, for example, from falling by being suspicious of drops, and we learn new things by being inquisitive. And there's more. There is never one region of the brain that's responsible for one thought or one emotion. Different people scan differently, different cultures scan differently, emotions are complicated and as culturally contingent as the biochemistry that enacts them. And furthermore, incredibly, after an injury, the brain can remap itself so that the tasks usually undertaken in the damaged areas can be delegated to other areas. So that famous amygdala that lit up fear in the 2008 study? 
That amygdala has also been reported to light up in moments of happiness, anger and even arousal. It also manages the brain's response to excitement and new things. The amygdala lights up, for example, in some people when looking at a picture of a Ferrari. And that rational ACC, that's also responsible for reward anticipation, decision making, impulse control and emotion. So it leads to the question, what the hell do we mean by fear or rationality when we're looking at a picture of a candidate or scanning the brain? We can only learn from the scans by correlation and our understanding of these phenomena through other areas of research. And like the brain's ability to remap itself, we can't even say that liberals and conservatives are wired in certain ways. Studies have shown that when presented with a threat, liberals tend to become more conservative. That is to say, they adapt to the new environment. All of this then raises another question. If we act according to the way our brains are constructed, do we have any free will in making political decisions at all? From those initial studies, it would seem like the answer is no. But again, a deeper look reveals more. One study has shown that the brain's cerebral decision to use an emergency brake in a car occurs 130 milliseconds before we are aware of it. And famed Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist Benjamin Libet has shown that there's a half second delay between the brain getting ready and the conscious awareness of an intention to do something. Studies like this have been cited by many as proof that we have no free will over that initial desire to do something. If these bubble up in our subconscious and there's brain activity before we actually engage in doing a thing, then we don't have any volition. It's not something we do of our own conscious accord. But many forget the next bit of Libet's experiment. He also found that there was another 150 milliseconds between being conscious of the inclination to do the thing and the brain's actual engaging of that inclination, giving plenty of time for the brain to change its mind. As we all know, sometimes we have second thoughts, which takes us down the rabbit hole further. How can we have second thoughts? Why might we have a second thought? And who is the I that makes that second thought when it's responding to other parts of the brain? Who is the I that overrides a desire to do something, that says pull up the emergency brake, actually false alarm? We're back to philosophy. In this case, Descartes and his famous I, the singular rational ego at the center of things. The brain science disputes this. As you can see, there are lots of back and forth. There are different types of I. There are different amounts of I. And how does that I that makes a second decision, that has a second thought, decide? Where does it draw that knowledge from? When does it kick in? Does it consult history, the media, politics, philosophy? There is always something more, something extra. Jan de Vos criticises this new line of thought that prioritises focusing on the materiality and the emotion in our brains. In The Metamorphosis of the Brain, de Vos argues that although at first glance we appear to be dealing with the metamorphosis of the psychological into the neurological, one where the former appears to be irretrievably lost, closer inspection reveals that psychology is still the silent partner of the neurosciences. And on top of this, psychology is the silent partner of sociology, of history, of philosophy, in short, the humanities. To understand why conservatives might be suspicious of change and how that might change over time, we have to look at philosophies of change, psychologies of anxiety, histories of failed revolutions, and a hundred other things. Neuroscience provides no answers without these. So while neuroscience is of course an exciting and innovative field, it is nonetheless a young discipline well in its infancy. It's another string in our bow, but it may be a long time, if ever, 
before it gives us any concrete answers about the real nature of human consciousness and the human experience. If you want to support Then and Now, then please subscribe below and most importantly, click the bell here to receive notifications when I upload a new video. You can also follow me on Facebook, Twitter and Instagram in the links in the description below. And if you're feeling really generous, then this channel only exists through the support of pledges on Patreon, where you can support new content with as little as a dollar for each new video. Thanks for watching. See you next week.